Welcome everyone, my name is Ilva Tanra, I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Centre. This is Balkans Debrief, an online interview series that covers recent development in the region of the Atlantic Council's in Washington, D.C. The Ukraine war has raised expectations on the European Union enlargement in the Western Balkans and beyond. Is there reason for optimism? And even with a renewed vigor on the part of the West, can the old lingering problems of the region be overcome? Today's guest, Ivan Vevoda, permanent fellow of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, a seasoned observer of the region and a tireless advocate for Western values and ideas. Ivan, thank you for joining me on the Balkans Debrief. Thank you very much, Tara, for the invitation. Really honored. Uh, next week, as you very well know, the EU Council could make fateful decisions on the future of the EU enlargement, including whether to grant Ukraine and possibly Moldova the candidate status. Do you expect something meaningful to happen or more delays or half measures? Well, uh, I think that uh, there are great expectations that something bold and courageous needs to be decided given the terrible historic situation of the Russian aggression and invasion unprovoked of Ukraine, a sovereign European country with European aspirations, at least since the Orange Revolution back in 2004. Uh, we have heard uh, through the visit of the prime ministers of Italy, France and Germany to Kiev that in fact they are standing now very clearly and determinedly for Ukraine to get candidacy at the summit uh, in Brussels on the 23rd, 24th of June. So I think that's a very heartening uh, a piece of news that, that we're hearing that Europe has decided to make a bold move uh, in spite of all the questions that were raised, what would it mean for a Ukraine to get candidacy given the applications of Georgia and Moldova and of course the long-lasting accession process of many uh, of the six Western Balkan countries of which two don't yet have candidacy, namely Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Uh, whereas, for example, a North Macedonia has been in the pipeline of EU enlargement as a candidate country since 2005. So, to your question, uh, it is a, a mixed picture with some uh, very good and positive signs because there is an advance towards enlargement, but there are a lot of, I would say, deceptions uh, and frustrations with the length of the process, with the slowness of democratic reforms in the Western Balkan countries to varying degrees, of course, and to the fact that Europe, the European Union, over the past let's say since the beginning of the financial crisis back in 2008, has been somewhat complacent and has taken uh, the eye off the ball, which has allowed for third country actors to intervene in the Balkans in their own different ways. And of course, we're speaking mainly of Russia and China. Ivan, do you expect any positive news uh, for the Western Balkans? Well, all that we're hearing is that we won't hear uh, positive news. Uh, I don't think that, for example, Bosnia or Kosovo will get candidacy. Uh, I don't think that we will get a, a date for the countries. Uh, there have been suggestions, as you have heard, I'm sure, uh, by a certain number of actors that, uh, for example, 2033 would be a date of entry that uh, there would be uh, a certain number of steps taken to bring the countries to the table. And in fact, what has been good, I think there have been a flurry of activities, both in the think tank world, in the uh, political world, and in the capitals of Europe that count, and especially now France holding the, the presidency, the Czech Republic that succeeds France and then Sweden, looking at ways in which all of these countries, and I'm now talking about the Western Balkan Six, can come to the table, proverbially, 
and become an integral part of different elements of the European Union before they come full member states, and in particular to benefit from the financial support that is lacking in these countries. Namely, the process is simply seems eternal and uh, politicians cannot hinge their political future on something that might happen in 10 or 15 years time. And uh, the most concrete thing that we have heard is that possibly there would be a, a, a very uh, robust package helping the countries wean themselves off fossil fuels coming from Russia. And we're talking about oil and gas. Whether that actually happens, we'll need to see in about a week's time. Uh, so are, we, are you talking about the potential EU single market uh, invitation to have the Western Balkan region part of that market or the Macron's idea of a political uh, community or which is going to be? Do you think there is willingness on the part of the EU countries uh, to, to act on this and not wait for 2033 for membership? I, I think there's a clear realization, and unfortunately, the Russian aggression on Ukraine has focused the minds of the member states of the European Union, not only of the important ones, but of everyone, that something needs to be done urgently, because this is about the credibility of the European Union as a project, as a peace project, and about the future of the European Union in the global strategic environment that we're seeing with the rising China, a G2 world of the US and, and China, and of course of, of a Russia that's trying to make itself great again. And so the various ideas, you mentioned the single market idea, there is the idea of uh, staged uh, accession, so step by step, or the what's called the phasing in, and, and now these ideas of a European Confederation or most recently President Macron's idea of a European political community, I would, I would subscribe to all of them uh, or a combination uh, of all of the below and above because it is urgent that these countries come to the table in a number of ways. Otherwise, we will see a faltering of the project of the European integration. The only thing I just want to follow up on that is that uh, all of these ideas can be even more confusing in an environment that uh, is still suffering of the enlargement fatigue. So something more concrete and with uh, timeline and steps would be uh, more welcomed in the region, I guess. You're absolutely right. This has to be very concrete. There need to be a very clear set of conditions. Uh, that cannot be impossible ones that cannot be met in a timeline of, of, of several months or a year. And I, I will give you an example of how these countries of the Western Balkans were de facto members of the European Union. That was during the migration crisis. There was the famous so-called Balkan route through which the Syrian and other refugees were making it from Turkey, Greece, through the Balkans to Austria and Germany. The Balkan countries had to be at the table in Berlin, in Brussels, for a solution to be found. So, in extreme circumstances, there was no problem to have these countries sit as equal partners at the table and be part of the decision-making process. That may be an extreme example, but I think it gives you a flavor of what could be done on security, on economic issues, on you know sharing intelligence where it's appropriate and other. I absolutely I understand your point and I agree with it. It's time for EU to consider Balkans Europe as, as they actually are. In my last conversation for Balkans Debriefed, I asked Veton Suroi from Kosovo about the failure of the last three meetings between Vucic and Kurti uh, on the so-called normalization dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. And he reiterated that the dialogue uh, should be serious and it has been a failure indeed for the last 10 years. Uh, what do you believe is the cause for the stalled dialogue? Well, I'm glad to hear that you talked to my good friend Beton uh, on these issues. We've been part of these efforts to bring uh, this to some kind of close over, over decades. Unfortunately, as, as you and he said, this has lasted much too long, and in particular in the last period, 
uh, it hasn't moved forward. Uh, a lot hinged on domestic political issues, elections, so there were, let's say, some justified reasons. On the other, there was lack of political leadership to actually realize that it is better for all of us, for the two countries, for the two capitals, to move and resolve an issue because it's not good to have something that's unresolved in your life. And so the fact that um, we haven't seen uh, much, uh, much concrete advance, I think, is due to the fact that Europe has actually taken its eye off the ball, as I said, generally on the integration process, but also on the unresolved issues. We do have the excellent example of North Macedonia and Greece having found it in themselves to courageously step up against their public opinions in Greece and North Macedonia and make a decision for future generations. Unfortunately, the European Union did not respond in kind and frankly, one must put the blame on the door of the French because in October 2019, they blocked the advance of Albania and North Macedonia. So back to Serbia and Kosovo, I think that uh, the re-engagement, and here we need to mention the United States, uh, who's a very important actor in our region. Yes, the US acknowledges the uh, leading role of the European Union, but without the US, this will not happen. I'm hoping this, with a strong re-engagement of the US, and now again because of the Ukraine uh, war, that the European Union will actually take more serious steps to get the two parties to move forward on a number of still open issues and, of course, towards finding the comprehensive solution at the end. Ivan, yes, I agree. The US and the EU seem to finally have joined forces uh, in uh, helping this normalization dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade. But so far, for the current stalemate, who is to blame? I know this is an easy question to ask and difficult to answer. I think everyone uh, has their share of blame and uh, I wouldn't go into percentages. I think it's, it's easier to answer it that way because uh, whether it's the European Union, the US on the external side or in Belgrade and Pristina, as I said, there were, there were objective reasons, if one can put it, there were elections in both, in both countries. Uh, as we know, you know, politicians try to get re-elected and uh, that really stalls the process. We don't see it only in our countries, it's everywhere. And in fact, the reason that, that France blocked North Macedonia and Albania at that particular juncture because there were local elections in France and President Macron was worried that he would lose some votes if he did that. So I, I think it's uh, beyond the, the question of apportioning uh, blame. I think it really behooves the leaders of the region. In this case, it's Prime Minister Kurti and, uh, and President Vucic to really uh, take the bull by the horns, if I can put it that way, because the world is moving on. There are a number of things that, that are happening. And uh, I, I, I repeated, do we want to be countries that have an unresolved situation like the Kashmir situation between India and Pakistan for the past 70 years? Do we want to be like Cyprus where more than 45 years things are unresolved? Yeah, probably one can live with a status quo, but it's not healthy in any way, political, economic, social, or in security terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, Serbian President Vucic appeared to be under pressure uh, during the press conference with uh, German Chancellor Scholz, uh, who asked for Serbia's recognition of Kosovo. Is pressure like, like this a positive thing or it is counterproductive in your view? I think there's a reality that everyone knows and uh, very few people acknowledge that given what happened in the 90s, given what happened under the Milosevic regime and what the Milosevic regime did uh, uh, in the former Yugoslavia and in Kosovo, and that doesn't mean that others don't have responsibilities for what happened, but after the NATO uh, bombing uh, and the intervention, uh, Kosovo became de facto independent. It is the jure, uh, still part of Serbia under UN Resolution 1244, and we are caught in between uh, this, in, in this legal limbo, 
uh, at the moment. Uh, very, various Serbian leaders from, from Gingic to Tadic to Nikolic and others have, for example, I think President Tadic said, we don't have a, Serbia doesn't have a Minister of Agriculture in Kosovo, or we all know that we have very little possibility to, to intervene. So there's been a, a realistic acknowledgement of the situation. There's been some movement forward. Of course, the 2013 April Brussels Agreement was a big step when the police in the north and the legal system were integrated in the Kosovo system. So it's not that there haven't been a certain number of moves, but there hasn't been a clear solution on things like, like water, energy, license plate, uh, on, on uh, university degrees. So, I think that there's been an announcement on both sides that some uh, agreements are forthcoming literally in the in the coming weeks. We'll see if that happens. If that happens, that means there's a realization that, to come back to your word, pressures are working and that um, Europe, uh, one has to give it credit, has always been very clear. Uh, the European Union will not take in, as they've said privately and publicly, a new Cyprus, a country, in other words, that has unresolved territorial issues. So in Serbia, it's very clear this has to be solved if Serbia wants to become an EU member state. This is my, my next question, actually. What is the sentiment in your homeland, in Serbia, between Serbian citizens? Do they, uh, are they aware of this pressure and they know that Kosovo should uh, be recognized as an independent European state or not? I think there's, uh, there's a reality and common sense in 90% of people in any country to see what the reality is. And that's why I say it behooves the leadership of a country to move forward and resolve an outstanding issue that everyone looks at and sees it is untenable to keep it in the way it is. I will recall that I had the honor of working for Prime Minister of Serbia, Zoran Djindjic, back in 2002 and three, and he was the leader who most clearly said, Serbia needs to solve this as quickly as possible. He was assassinated nearly 20 years ago, and we're still in an unresolved situation. I think this leadership and President Vucic has said it over the 10 years that he's been in various leadership posts. He said at one point, do we want a president in 20 years in Serbia to say, my goodness, we still haven't resolved this. I interpret this as saying we should resolve this. We, of course, have to judge leaders not on their words, but on their deeds. And so we'll see pretty soon whether we're moving in the right direction a little faster than we, uh, as we should. Why do you say pretty soon? What's, what's your expectation? Well, because, as I said, there was an announcement by both Mr. Beslimi uh, and on the Serbian side that we might probably see uh, an agreement on the energy issue and on the license plate, which, which would be a breakthrough in our small world. <laughs> also, Vucic announced a three-year gas deal uh, contract with uh, Gazprom while the EU countries and the candidate countries joined the sanctions against Russia after Ukraine war. Uh, EU leaders have urged Belgrade to, to make a choice between the West and the Russia instead of staying in two chairs. Do you believe Vucic is now capable of making a clear pro-Western decision if not, what else drives the Serbia relationships with Russia apart from the economic and energy ties? Well, you're right to point out the energy ties. I think that in the real world, that's really what's, what's driving it. There's, of course, the question of the possible veto of Russia at the Security Council, but I would say that's further away than, than the energy issue. Serbia, as you know, has joined all the statements at the UN and voted along with those who have condemned the Russian aggression. Uh, they voted at the EBRD for the expulsion of Russia. They voted at the Council of Europe for the expulsion of Russia. So on that front, Serbia has done what's needed. It is sticking out uh, on this issue that it hasn't introduced sanctions. And I have uh, publicly said in Serbia that I think Serbia should join sanctions at, at some level simply to align with the foreign policy of the European Union uh, and the US on, on these cases. But I would say that a number of countries that have joined the sanctions 
uh, I, I live currently in, in, in Vienna, uh, you know, they are paying for their gas in rubles. Uh, Hungary, that's a member state, as we know, is aligned uh, on, on the oil and gas. And so countries are finding ways in which, yes, they've joined sanctions, but sort of under the table have deals. That, that's the real world. It's realistic. But that doesn't excuse Serbia from not joining a level of the regime sanction. And I would expect that Serbia will, as the new government comes in at some point during the summer, uh, be actually joining some, some of these sanctions because, and I will say this because it's important to repeat, given the whole noise in the media system, we are all Western societies. You ask the existential question of people in Serbia, all the questions are positive to the West. Where, where would you like to live? Where would you like to send your children? Where do you travel for summer holidays? What cars do you buy? What products do you buy? Nobody answers Moscow or Russia on those questions. A final question on the dialogue. Uh, should a different format uh, be sought? Uh, should something be d done differently uh, from President Vucic, from Serbia? Well, as, as we know, it, it started as a so-called technical dialogue under President Tadic in Serbia back in March of 2011. So we're in the process for 11 years, more than 11 years already. Then it was raised during the tenure of uh, Kathy Ashton as the high rep for foreign policy uh, in 2012 that led to the Brussels agreement. Look, I think uh, more than, than process and format, it's really about political will and political courage and leadership. Does he have it? I think, I think he does. And I think it, uh, in case of all Serbian leaders, uh, except for Prime Minister Djindjic, who really wanted, not only had the courage and the rhetoric, but was moving forward on it. All the others had a hesitancy, but as we say, it takes two to tango. Uh, no matter what each side says, they need to shake hands on a deal where they will be the owners of the agreement and the solution. Ivan, thank you very much for joining me in uh, Balkans Debrief for this uh, conversation. Thank you very much for the invitation, Elva. You can also follow us on Twitter at AC Europe, and I would encourage you to join our conversation by, uh, by using hashtag Balkans Debrief.